Welcome to the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, a platform created to entertain, educate, and grow the game of tennis at all levels. My friends call me Ship, but this show isn't about me. We will be bringing you interviews with coaches, community leaders, and players, along with updates about tennis happening around the world. Tennis is a culture, and we are all writing tennis history together. Today, I'm here with Jesse Levine. For those of you that follow tennis as closely as I do, this is not a name uh, that you'd be unfamiliar with, but just in case you don't know uh, Jesse from his playing career, he has a career high of 69 uh, in the world in singles. He was a top 100 singles player. Uh, obviously, you know, he has a lot to share with us being someone uh, who had the opportunity to play all four Grand Slams and uh, was able to play on tour uh, for several years. Uh, Jesse additionally, has a lot of information that I'm sure he could share with us about junior tennis. He was uh, junior Wimbledon doubles champion in 2007. Um, he also uh, had the opportunity to play college tennis, and he played for the University of Florida. Uh, Jesse, I, if I if I remember right, you only played college tennis for one year. Am I wrong? No, you are correct. And uh, at the time, you'd had quite the the freshman season. You went twenty four and one. Who was that loss to that year? I lost in the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament in Athens, Georgia, to Alex Slavic from University of Washington. Yeah. Um, um, I always I always tell people I wish I would have lost during a uh, dual match season play because as a freshman playing number one at University of Florida. It had never been done. Um, a freshman come in, play number one, gone undefeated throughout the, the season, and then gone on to win NCAA. So as NCAAs was going on, each match just kept getting more pressure and more pressure. And as an 18, 19-year-old, that just uh, started getting to me, and I was playing a little bit tentative tennis. And it, uh, you know, credit to Alex. He played a great match in the quarterfinals. I remember watching him then play against John Isner, and he had a lot of chances uh, – in the semis, uh, moving on. Now, is that the year the Varman won? Yes. Yeah, Somdev won that year. Yeah, and he won that back to back, which is crazy. People don't talk about how hard that he is. Did. It's so hard to do. Uh, I'm sure just feeling that pressure, trying to be the first ever, uh, you like you said, freshman to go undefeated, playing one, and then and then try to win the NCAA's. That pressure might not be quite the same, but you probably, when you saw Steve Johnson trying to three-peat, you probably are like, I kind of know what that feels like, that pressure of being that college guy with the big match and you not just the weight of, you know, your expectation, but also a university and an entire fan base kind of on your back. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I mean, look, Steve, Steve and I are, are very good friends and we've kind of reminisced about that a little bit and, uh, I have the utmost respect for, for for Steve Johnson, not only as as a tennis player and the career that he's had, but also as a person. He's he's just a good guy overall, and uh, yeah, we've become very good friends over the years. So we're gonna back things up here just a little bit, Jesse, and I and I kind of want to start with uh, as someone who I I take in a lot of tennis media. I think it's important, uh, and I think people want to know uh, first of all, what is your racket of choice? So I use the Technofiber TF40 uh, 305. And is your uh, is your racket weighted down? Yeah, it is customized um, to my specs. Unweighted, it's probably around it will 305 weighted. Uh, unstrung, it's probably around 330, and then strung probably closer to 345, 350. Do you remember about what age you started weighing your rackets down? Um, I would say I was probably 14 years old the first time I ever started putting lead tape on my on my tennis rackets and customizing them. Yeah. And I think that's something that maybe for casual tennis people, they don't realize, but uh, uh, just how much uh, help it is to kind of absorb other people's pace and to kind of have a little bit of that effortless power by adding a little weight to your racket. No, 100%. I, I don't think that I could play with a racket off the shelf. Um, I, even when, you know, now I'll, I'll, I'll teach some lessons and, you know, I'll go and show somebody, you know, the, the technique or I'll do a drop feed with a racket that, you know, they're using that has no weight on it. It feels almost hollow to me. So yeah, definitely. Once you start doing that, you, you won't go back because it's a game changer. Yeah, for sure. 
So this is a this is kind of a fun question for me, but I want to know who was the first person to really kick your butt? And I'm hoping to get an answer here, maybe Joe, growing up in the juniors, but then also uh, like when you hit that pro tour, uh, could you give us an experience from both of those perspectives? Yeah, juniors, juniors was in Canada. His name was Billy Timu. Um, and his brother and him were, uh, were both college NCAA tennis players. Billy played in San Diego state, I believe. And then his brother, Stefan team who played at university of Georgia, but Billy in the 14 and unders was a man amongst boys because I mean, uh, I'm about five foot nine, a buck 65 buck 70. And when I was 13, 14 years old, I probably was barely, you know, a hundred pounds and Billy was already six foot four, you know, weighing in like 190 and serving 130 miles an hour in the 14s. Um, so he was really the first guy in juniors to really um, to clean my clock, I'd say, because I didn't know what, what hit me playing against him in juniors. But we, we had a great relationship, and as years went on, I got my revenge eventually. So that was uh, pretty sweet. Um, I would say on the pro tour, um, I got my – Welcome to the big leagues in my first ever U.S. Open um, main draw. Uh, I played against Nikolai Davidenko, who was oh. at that time. Yeah, that time he was four in the world. And, um, and I was just turning pro out of college. So that was my first ever match as a professional tennis player on the grandstand, the old grandstand at the U.S. Open against Nikolai Davidenko, four in the world. Um, and to be honest, like, I went out there and I had the green light. I mean, I was swinging for the fences. And the first, first set and a half really felt like I actually played pretty well, but it, it wasn't anything remotely close after that. I mean, he, he's just welcome to the big league. So it was definitely an eye-opener for me. So I have to ask, because that's obviously not on my list of questions, but that's not someone that gets talked about enough, I feel like. And I remember watching him growing up and just being – amazed by Davidenko what do you feel like made him special so he didn't really have the firepower to really blow somebody off the court and for someone like me that was a horrible matchup um, <laughs> especially my first match as a professional because look I, I'm my game I, w I was very fast and I took mm -hmm. time away from my opponents because I didn't have the firepower to blow anybody off the court either, right? So I had to use my smarts and my speed, you know, to use turn my defense into offense real quickly. But he did everything <laughs> 10 times better than me. I mean, his, his movement was incredible. It was almost impossible to get him off balance. The redirection of shots that he could place, you know, on a dime was extremely impressive. And he was very frustrating to play because he didn't give you any free points. So, you know, because I remember watching him play against Federer, and there would be times where I watch and Federer would dominate at times, but then I would see times where Davidenko would really frustrate him because, you know, literally you felt like you had to hit three to four winners to, to win a point against him. He really, you know, made you work for every single point. I feel like junior players back in the day could really learn a lot from Davidenko because I felt like he was a tactician, like he would find a way – to lower your level when he was playing those other top guys, like he was a strategist. And, and to me, not obviously quite the same, but I always think it'd be good for junior players to go out and watch someone like David Gofan. Cause I feel like he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's a serve plus one expert. He's so good with his patterns. He comes in and he executes strategically. And uh, I feel like that's not quite the same, but it would be a kind of that comparison because go fans that out here, you know, blowing people off the well, uh, you're, pace. You're just throwing out names that are just horrible matchups for me, and I hated yeah. playing both of them. <laughs> and I, I played Gofan uh, four times. I beat him once, but I hated playing him because he literally did – I mean, we had a very similar game style, but, again, he just did everything a little bit better than me, you know? So, uh, for me, I had to be really on, and he had to have an off day for me to really have a good shot at him. But he's deceivingly good, and, and – and, you know, people don't realize how tricky it is to play against someone like that.
I remember watching you play Jesse and I was kind of the, I was, I was a serve and volley player in college and I was um, not a baseliner. And uh, I remember you being able to do a little bit of everything. And I, I think uh, in particular, I remember a few points growing up uh, when I was watching you play, like you could be way behind the baseline and then you would fight to get back up to that baseline. You'd be trying to take that ball early whenever you could. Obviously you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you know, counter punch when you get the opportunity, maybe on a ball, you can catch on the rise. What being someone that is five, nine, according to the stats, I mean, what is the hardest part of that on the pro tour? I mean, was is it a struggle to fight to stay up on that baseline? Is that something whenever you transitioned from, you know, college to the pro tour that was difficult or um, with your play style, do you feel like that was something that you were able to figure out pretty quickly? Well, I think, well, look, I, I my, my style of play didn't change tremendously, you know, from college to pros. I don't think, I think, the biggest thing that changed was physically I got stronger and mentally I got a lot stronger as well. Um, my, my goal was always to have kind of a, an all court game. And I, I really did like to come into the net. That was something that surprised a lot of people because like you said, most guys that are serving volley or guys that like to come into the net are usually bigger, lankier guys. Right. But, you know, you take a guy, um, you know, I know plenty of guys that were, you know, six foot three, six foot four that didn't come in that often. I mean, Sam Query's a, a prime example. Love Sam Query. Great friend of mine. Uh, stay in touch to this day. He really didn't come to the net that much, but he had the firepower where he could finish points from the baseline. I didn't have that. So for me, I was always looking to take the ball as early as I could and, and mm -hmm. to finish points at the net. Because if I were to stay back on the baseline, I could get pushed back and then I'd have to you know, work that much harder to, to finish points. So for me, I think that was a key part to my game. And surprisingly for a guy, you know, my, my, my size, I would say I had my best results on grass. Um, and, third and round Wimbledon's really not like, bad. Third round, yeah, third round yeah, Wimbledon's yeah, not bad. A lot of people yeah. would kill for that. That was probably the biggest win of my career that year as well. I, I mean, I, I beat Murat Sappin first round Wimbledon for number one um, in 2009. And so that kind of really put me on the map um, when I, when I took out Saf in that year. Uh, there's, there's many of people that I bet wish they could say that they beat uh, Saf at Wimbledon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was, like I said, that, that for sure was probably the biggest win of my career. If, if people didn't know you, that would be like a really good, like two truths and a lie like situation it's like, like was, <laughs> because they'd be like there's no way this guy like it just it, it doesn't make sense right it's uh yeah that, it's, it, it's a david versus goliath pretty much yeah yeah you have to put it on every resume for sure yeah. um uh, if you're applying for a job definitely throwing that out there um okay so let's let's we'll come back to more of this this playing stuff obviously you've you've gotten the opportunity to, to do a lot of cool things um like you were saying, you like to have an all-court game. I remember watching you, you know, you'd get the opportunity to take a ball early, and every time you attack that net, it's almost like, you know, it's very tactful. It's like you almost snuck in sometimes because you're so quick. It was like you take the ball early, and then you're on that net. For someone who's trying to kind of have that all-court game, I guess, what do you feel like a uh, a good practice session looks like? I lost you there for a second. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Did you catch the question? No, I lost you there for a second, and I apologize. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question because it'll be easy to edit back in. So, okay, cool, cool. Okay, so obviously uh, someone like yourself that has an all-court game, you know, you you uh, you kind of talked about wanting to have that all-court game, and, um, you know, you'd be in the middle of a point, and you'd then all of a sudden you would take that ball early, and it, it always seemed so tactful because you were so quick, and all of a sudden it's almost like you snuck to the net, uh, and you would take advantage and, and try to finish those points at the net. So as someone who was trying to play 
with an all court game, what do you feel like a good practice session looks like for someone who wants to? Be oh, okay, that's that's a great player? question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know probably some of my my best practice sessions were were with the late Nick Voluntary. Um, You know, I I spent a lot of time at at the IMG Academy before I went to college, and I had the the pleasure of being on Nick's court um, time and time again. And he was a huge believer when he would watch me play on me being aggressive, controlled aggression, but using my speed, like you said, to, you know, really surprise people, take time away from them. So a really great drill that we would do is I had to always stay, you know, inside the baseline, take the ball early and then find a way into the net. And then we would do the same thing where I would stand three, four feet behind the baseline and then kind of surprise attack somebody and finish the point at the net. And the goal is always for me to finish the point at the net because, you know, we, we definitely saw eye to eye on that where, you know, yeah. Can I stand 10 feet behind the baseline and, you know, grind it out and, and, and try and wait for my opponents to make mistakes? Yes, but that was only going to work to a certain extent and to a certain level. Um, I could get by doing that, you know, in junior tennis and, you know, to some extent in college tennis. But once you get to to the big leagues and the pros, that, that that's not going to cut it anymore. Um, and so that was a drill that we really emphasized was me you know, hitting from the back controlled about 80, 85% and then sneak attack and find a way to get into the net and finish the point. That was something that I did on a daily basis. I think that's a great drill. Uh, one of my favorite drills to have junior players do is, is uh, to play short sets. Uh, but when they play, I tell them that it doesn't have to be a clean winner, but the person who wins the point, if their last ball is out of the air, that if they win the point and their last shot that they like, let's say, you know, it's a drop volley, the other person touches it, doesn't matter, whatever, it's a swinging volley. If you move forward and your last ball is out of the air, it's worth two points. And that's, yeah, that's something, great. That I, that's something great. I do with yeah. my juniors. And, I, and I've noticed them, you know, attacking the net a little more comfortably over time. You know, you play a short set to four. And I think any junior player that can get out there and play uh, and, and kind of incentivize and, and, and change up the rules a little bit, and make it fun and, and, and obviously incentivize moving forward and finishing at the net. I think that's uh, that's a great thing to be practicing. So, no, I, yeah, I, I love that. And you can't you can't be afraid. You know, it's playing fearless tennis. Um, you know, you always would emphasize, you know, in nervous moments that racket speed is your friend. Um, cause I, I see a lot of players that, that, that I've worked with from, you know, juniors to pros in a nervous situation, you know, the racket speed slows down and that's when you miss and that's when the ball flies on you. Um, you know, with, with technology and the rackets and string, you know, the faster you swing through the ball, the more grab you can get on it and the more, you know, control you really have. So that was something that Nick really emphasized was racket speed is your friend. What would you say, um, what would you say is obviously other than a couple of things you shared, is, is, is there like a best piece of advice that you ever got from Nick Voltaire? Well, that's hard. That's hard to say. I, I mean, figured that, it would be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's so hard. Honestly, like, I mean, I spent a lot of time with him um, and you know, I, it was, it was just super thankful to and blessed to have spent that kind of time with, with the legend himself, Nick. And, you know, I, I, I clearly can remember times where, you know, we would be, you know, in the indoor facility at IMG or on his stadium court at IMG, and he would put his hand on, on your neck. And when he talked to you, you listen. I mean, nothing else around you mattered. And I, I just remember he, he was probably one of the best motivators as well. I think a lot of people, you know, knew that about him, that he was a motivator, but he was also like very personable. Um, and every time it, whether I was there and my parents were there or someone was there that was close to me, he would pull us all aside and he would talk and, and really give you some great advice. I, 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 nothing really, you know, stands out the most to me if something that he really said, but, um, I think this is going to sound funny as I, I played a lot of golf with him as well. And, and I remember I hit a great shot to about two, three feet 
and I was looking at him to say, Hey, you're good. And I was, I was waiting and he saw me waiting for him to say that it was good. And he looked at me and he goes, ain't no gimmies in life, Jess. That's what he said to me. Um, but then on the next hole, he was sure to take away his five footer without anyone telling him it was good. <laughs> that was that was that Nick sounds for a, you. that sounds about right. I was gonna say that that sounds yeah, about that, right. That was that was Nick. That was Nick. Yeah, classic. So obviously, we're talking about uh, practice sessions with an all-time great coach. You famously had the opportunity to train uh, with an all-time great player in Roger Federer uh, in 2007. Uh, you had the opportunity to train with Federer in Dubai. Tell us about that experience. Well, first of all, I was a freshman in college, um, and I got a phone call. I was at study hall, and I got a phone call, and I answered, and they're like, this is you know, so-and-so calling on behalf of Roger Federer, and I hung up the phone because I thought <laughs> it was one of my I, – I really thought it was one of my teammates – you know, playing a prank on me or something. Um, and then I got another call and it was from a different number, but same area code. And they called me back and I was like, I am so sorry. <laughs> I felt so bad. Um, and they're like, no, we really would love for you to, you know, come and practice with, you know, Roger Federer in Dubai. And I was kind of like really taken back because obviously I was so excited and couldn't hold back my enthusiasm for that. So I jumped on that and I, I uh, spent three weeks in Dubai with uh, Roger Federer. It was one of the coolest experiences that I ever got to to, to partake in. Um, and through that relationship, you know, I, I got to train with him a lot more often, even at tournaments. And then he brought my dad and I um, to Turks and Caicos as well. So I got to train with him on multiple occasions. But that was the one that really kind of publicized because it was – for a three week time period. And it was right before I was about to turn pro. And um, I think the thing for me that really, really stuck out uh, to me about that experience was one, how down, down to earth, how humble he really is. It's not, you know, just what people see on TV. It's, it's real. And second of how hard he, he really works. Cause when people see him um, at tournaments throughout the year they don't see the work that he puts in um i mean he is a beast on and off the court and no one saw that they just see him at tournaments and how relaxed and chill and calm he always is whether he's just warming up or practicing he always looked like effortless but i tell you what i got i got to see a side to him that not too many people get to see and and he put in the work i'll tell you that i think that's something that junior players in general just need to hear because I think sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll get on the practice court and they think, you know, quantity over quality. But uh, I, I feel like better is a prime example. You're talking about, you know, how he's a workhorse and he puts that effort in. I, I guarantee that he wasn't going, you know, 50% pace, you know, when he was no, never, putting never. his hard work, he was, he went out there and I'm sure he was playing at his top level for as long as he could. And then when he needed a break, that that had to do with his stamina. And I'm sure he stopped. You know, but his best, one of his best, one of his closest in. friends. Yeah, one of one of his closest friends, uh, Eves Allegro, who was a top doubles player in the world at the time. He was also there. So you know, Roger would would do two on ones with us, and then I would go for as long as I could. Then Eves would come in, and we'd rotate in and out because at that point in in my, in my career, I couldn't I couldn't withstand training for him with him for three to four hours straight. Um, so he would, he would give us a rest. So he'd get the fresh guy in there. And, and I loved it. I, every time I was in there, I was going 110% because who knew if I was ever going to get that opportunity again, to, to spend that kind of time and, and just take in that sort of knowledge. And I, I think one thing that I took back from, from that trip that really stuck with me was, you know, I feel like, like you, you said it that, you know, a lot of juniors think that, you know, you need to practice twice a day and you need to have that, that quantity. But, you know, R Roger was really big on practicing one time, but one time for a very long time, because he would always say like, when you play a match, 
you know, you're not going to stop and then come back, are you? And I said, no. He's like, yeah, that's right. So we would go for like one long period sometimes, and that would be it for tennis for the day. Okay, did he practice twice a day? Of course he did. But there were times where, you know, it would just be one long session, and, and that was it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's super valuable information for people to hear. Obviously, different people have different things that work for them. And, and such but to hear you know about an all-time great saying something along the lines of like hey i'm preparing in case i have to play a four-hour match so i'm gonna have to have practice sessions that are that are long and they're hard and i'm gonna have to go hard the whole time uh is i mean it just makes sense that's a common sense thing but for some reason we don't use that when we're planning our own uh practice sessions no 100 percent, 100 percent. i couldn't agree more i mean when, when, when you when you have someone like him say it you're like oh yeah it makes sense but you and I could have, you know, came up with that knowledge. But when it comes from someone like him, it, it's a little different coming from, you know, one of the greatest of all time compared, you know, to just a coach like you and I saying, hey, guys, like, you know, you should just do it once long today. Be like, well, why? Well, Roger Federer says, it. OK, sure. If Roger said it, then that's good. <laughs> exactly. So what do you feel like? Obviously, you've had a lot of diverse experiences, so. From that experience, what do you feel like top level junior tennis players should really be focused on? Well, easy for me to say, I, I, I would say just development. I think there's so many juniors that I was around when I was playing that were so keen on winning at such a young age. Um, and by the time it got to 16 and 18 unders, they were either burnt out or really weren't on the proper track of improving. Um, so many guys that I know in the 14s that were winning all the time, when it got to 16s and 18s, they, they really struggled because they weren't focused on developing their game and they were too focused on results and result oriented. And I think that, you know, any junior that I've worked with now, I, I, I emphasize, hey, when you're in the 12s and 14s, it, it, it ain't about winning and losing, it's about you getting better each day and improving so that by the time you're, you're hitting that stride later on in juniors, when it really matters and that that's when it's time to really, you know, up the game. I, I see so many kids, you know, do what they have to do to, to try and win matches. And, and I love that because they're competitive, but if you start, you know, doing the right things at a young age, it's only going to be easier as, as your career uh, progresses. Yeah, I think that all sounds, I mean, that all makes sense to me, but obviously from a coach's perspective, you know, it makes sense to the coaches. It doesn't always make sense to the parents and the players when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to get that across to them to focus on that development first, sometimes those. No, because they want to see results and you know, that they, they, that that's how they see improvement is they see results. And, I, and I'm not saying that you don't want to see results, but that's not what it's all, all about because I could tell you plenty of, of junior players, you know, in the 12s and 14s that were not, you know, top in the country. But by the time it came to 16s and 18s, they were top in the country and top recruits in college and some even went pro. Yeah. So obviously, you know, you had the opportunity to play on the, the pro tour. You've played the slams. You played obviously at a super high level in college playing at University of Florida. You've, you were a, you know, a junior, not many people can say that they were, you know, or even a junior slam champion singles or doubles. I mean, that's a super cool kind of resume piece. So you've, you've, you know, you've traveled the world, you've done a little everything and you've even coached not just at the, you know, the juniors, but at the pro tour level, uh, you made a stop doing that. Having all that experience now, if you could go back and give advice to your 13 year old self, and then again to your 18 year old self, what type of advice would you share with your younger self to maybe further along your own playing career? That's a great question. I, I, to my 13 year old self, I really don't think I would have changed much to my 13 year old self because that was when I first moved um, to the United States and I had one of the best coaches um, at, at, who was working at the Everett Tennis Academy at the time and his name was Andy Brandy. Um, and I, I loved it every second of that. And we still keep in touch to this day. Um, I wouldn't change anything 
uh, my 13 year old self. Now, 18 year old self, um, I definitely say I've said this, and and people have asked me, you know, if you would have gone back, would you have done anything different, like you know, gone to school or not gone to school or turned pro earlier or not gone to school? If if I would have gone back um, after I graduated high school, I would have gone to college right away. Um, I took a year off after I graduated high school and played pro for a year as an amateur, never took any prize money, uh, just up to expenses as NCAA uh, rules and regulations were different at that time. Um, so that I would have changed. I would not have played for a year. Um, I would have gone to school right away and gone for a bit longer and maybe even gone for three to four years. Um, don't get me wrong. I love playing, you know, college tennis that one year, but uh, that year on was kind of not pointless, but it made me realize that I wasn't ready yet. Um, and a lot of people were telling me to turn pro because in that year I was already like 300 ATP and then I chose to go to college. Most, most people, you know, 18, 19, if they're 300, if you're 300 the world, they're you're turn not pro. going. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that was, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it though. I wasn't was, ready for it mentally or physically. That was definitely the conversation that another uh, Florida Gator, Mr. Ben Shelton was having with himself about a year ago. And then he just had that string of challengers where he just was on the, you know, on the move, on the move, on the move. And then it yeah, yeah. made no sense. But at that point, it that's, and I think that's something that junior players kind of need to understand. It's like, Hey, if you're quartering, quartering, simming, winning challengers consistently, okay, you're ready. But if you're, yeah, I mean, look, I, I have no, no doubt about that. And, and again, I don't regret any decision that I made. I, if, but again, if I could have gone back and done it differently, that's what I would have done. And I, I would have not taken the year off and played pro. I would have gone right to school at an even younger age. Which would have um, Cause then I don't sense. know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I, I was at, at that time, I wasn't a hundred percent sold on, if I was going to go to school, if I was just going to turn pro, um, I was getting some offers, you know, from some agencies and some endorsement deals at that time. And I told myself I wasn't ready for that yet. And I wanted to go to school and experience it as well. And I'm so happy that I did do that, even though it was only for a year. Um, but that, that would have been the thing that I would have done different. I wouldn't have taken the year off. And I think in hindsight, that makes total sense. So his, you know, it's it's kind of nice to hear, though, you know, not every person can look at their 13 year old self and basically your only piece of advice would have been, hey, you're doing everything right. Keep doing what you're doing. I think that says. A yeah, lot. yeah, yeah. I had a lot of very good people in my corner and I trusted every person that was involved. Um, I had a very tight, tight inner circle, as I'd call it. And those are the people that I relied on and trusted um, and they're very key elements and and parts of my life whether it was you know playing on tour playing in college or like you said i, I mean i coached coached on tour for many years actually I, I spent a little bit of time with madison keys and then spent um a little while with jessica pagula as well so um just having that opportunity and and my coaches are people that i would still go to for advice when i was with madison and with jessica so how cool is that yeah no i I, I've seen I've seen the coaching resume. There's some jealousy here. I think that's a super cool opportunity. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Those are some uh, those are some pretty awesome people. I feel like to get the opportunity to coach. Kind of going back to you know, obviously you were someone who you know people throw the word elite around, but at 13, you were really good. Like at, at that you know for a young person, when you were you know, obviously having a lot of really good results, 13, 14 years old. How much of your training was physical training versus court time? Were you already really working hard on your fitness? Like what, what was, what was happening as far as your training at that age that kind of was taking you to that level where you were being very successful? So I didn't start, uh, well, how should I say it? I played four sports in high school when I first moved to Florida from Canada. So I didn't play only tennis until I was 15 years old. Um, and I think that was a key part of a lot of my success at a young age because I was such a happy kid and I, I lived a normal 
life per se, I would say, because I went to normal high school. Um, then I'd come and train at the academy. Then I'd go back and play soccer, baseball, basketball, and golf for the high school team. So for me, I was, you know, living the dream at that time. Like I, I'd go to school, then I'd come train, then I'd go back and play another sport. So I think at, at that time, like when I was 13 and 14, I was just playing everything. And um, that really helped me. It was like a cross training. So that was my fitness was playing other sports. Um, when I turned 15, that's when, you know, Andy Brandy um, and John Everett really sat down with me. And they're like, hey, if you really, you know, want to make a push at this and you want to be, um, you know, top of top of the level in, in the United States, you're going to have to make a commitment. And these other sports are going to have to go bye-bye. <laughs> and and um, then you're going to have to start training twice a day, you know, and doing the homeschool thing. And that was really hard for me. I, I hated doing the homeschool. If I didn't have to do that, I would have never have done that. Um, I love the social aspect of, you know, going to high school and having my friends there and, you know, hanging out. And all of a sudden that 15, 16, at, at 15 years old, that's when I sat down with, uh, my coach, Andy Brandy and John Everett at that time. And they were saying to me, Hey, Jess, like, if you really want to make a push for this, the next step is you having to give up your, your other sports and really dive into this tennis thing full on and, you know, start practicing twice a day and only playing tennis. If you want to be, you know, at that elite level. And, uh, that was hard for me because I didn't want to do the homeschool. I love going to, you know, normal school. I wouldn't say it's normal school. It was a, private school across the street from the academy where I could walk to and from across the street and go play tennis, then go back to school and play normal sports. So for me to give up all the other sports was, was hard. And to give up that, that normalcy, I should say of not going to school and doing homeschool, it sucked. I hated that, but I did it and I made that sacrifice and, you know, look, it, it paid off for sure. And I look back at that and I'm happy that I made that decision because at 15, that's when I started really diving into it full on and, and, um, you know, waking up early practicing, then doing school and then back on the court in the afternoon and fitness. And that's when things really, you know, started picking up and me getting to that next level at a, a lot faster pace than it was before. Okay. So I have a fun question. That's obviously not on my list of questions, but just hearing you talk, I have to know. So what's a bigger culture shock going from living in Canada to living in Florida or going from being a public school kid to homeschooling? Oh, <laughs> they're, they're both they're both culture shocks in their in their own way. You've been through a I lot, think, my guy. You've been through a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think uh, um, you know what, what people don't know is you know I didn't move from from Canada to Florida for for tennis at all. I think a lot of people think that that was the case. Um, I, I would have still been living in Canada to this day if it wasn't for. Uh, my younger brother who suffers from ulcerative colitis. Um, and we moved as a family when I was 13 because doctors were saying that living in warm weather all year round was much better for his health. And my dad had a great job opportunity. So we moved as a family and it had nothing to do with my tennis. So from a weather standpoint, that was definitely a shock, but a very nice one because the cold weather can get pretty rough up in, uh, up in Canada. Um, but then again, moving from public you know, normal high school to doing the homeschool online, a lot more freedom, but you had to be very disciplined and discipline is not something I really had an issue with, but I definitely missed out on having that normalcy, you know, seeing and being in class with, with your friends and, you know, having that time to socialize and living that, that normal type of life. But what 15, 16 year old kid, you know, gets to say that they're traveling all over the world to play sports. Um, so I, Yes, I missed out on a lot, but I also experienced things that, you know, very few get to experience. And I'm thankful for that every day. For sure. That's such a unique experience. Uh, so my next question is, uh, is one that I think that you, of all people, would have kind of an interesting perspective on. Obviously, someone who grew up in Canada, but also uh, had the opportunity to play some junior tennis in the United States. Is there anything that you would change about the way that junior tennis is currently structured in the U.S.? So that's that's a great question. I think 
I, I wouldn't change the way it's it's structured. I think, um, or I like, uh, how do I say? I with a lot of kids that I've had um, the experience of working with, you know, down here in Florida, uh, get really obsessed with UTR ratings. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm all for UTR, and I think it's such a great tool that that they have developed. Um, but it's not all about that. I mean, I know a lot of college coaches, it's extremely important to them. But if you're a, a real true tennis guru, coach, player, whatever it is, you will find, you know, that UTR that's uh, an 11 and that's gritty and works hard and find ways to win, they will take an 11 over, you know, an 11 six that, looks pretty and wins, you know, the, the, you know, the, the matches only when they're playing well, I, I think that, or that's um, match dodging and avoiding back draws. That was my next thing that really bothers me. That really bothers me is when I see kids, you know, just stop playing because they don't want it to affect their UTR. That to me is that's bogus. I, I, I don't know how, how to change that, but it, that would be something that I would, change if you're asking me about a structure that needs to change because if you stop a match because you're worried or you fake an injury because you're worried about your rating dropping yeah there needs to be consequences definitely i totally agree with that is there anything you would change about the way that college tennis or that you know the pro tour is currently structured no i, I wish there was a longer off season on the pro tour there's literally no off season uh when I talk yeah. to, you know, a lot of friends of mine that have played other professional sports, whether it's, you know, hockey or, you know, baseball or basketball. And I've, I, I, I have, you know, a lot of very close friends that play professional hockey. They have an off season. Um, tennis really doesn't have that um, because it, you finish, you know, um, in October uh, and then next thing you know, December, you're heading to Australia already. Um, I think that would be something – I don't know how you change that because it's giving so many players an opportunity to, you know, play all these tournaments throughout the year all over the world to make as much money as they can and accumulate the most amount of ranking points. I don't know how you would change that, but if there was a way to have a little bit longer in off season and, and make it a little more seasonal, that would be incredible. That's just my opinion. I've heard that a couple other places too, and I don't disagree. I think that totally makes sense. Um, I would love to see something that kind of gives back to the fans to where it's like, you know, up till the U.S. Open and then right after the U.S. Open, you have like, I don't know how you would do it, but you have like at least there, there needs to be like a month off. A lot of casual fans think that tennis ends when the U.S. Open ends. They don't realize well, that's my that point. That's other my tournaments point. Yeah. are still happening. Yeah. So even if and then yeah, there's I mean, I out could, there I like could, world yeah. team tennis, like where do they fit into all this? Like there's, there's, yeah. there's other structures yeah. that we could maybe use to better formulate the calendar, like nine months of, it would be great if you could find a way for it to be nine, 10 months of, of regular tennis. And then for those people that want to make more money, a really awesome, you know, during those two months off, if during one of those months, you want to go play world team tennis, because it's a way for you to make more money and to train a little bit. And it's actually like really cool for the fans. That's great. And then a month where there's just nothing going on because tennis needs to have an off season. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, could, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's, look, it's a grueling sport, that's for sure. But, you know, I, like you said, the, the average tennis fan thinks after the U.S. Open, like the season ends. And that's really when, when the whole other season, you go to Asia. I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, finishing up the U.S. Open, and I'm like, all right, now I got to go to Asia for a couple of weeks to go play some more tournaments. So I went and played tournaments in China and Japan um you know in the fall right after the u.s open so that that to me another the other thing that i i mean again i don't like the way that they made the change to davis cup the way it is because davis cup to me is one of the one of the coolest um you know weeks of of professional tennis and to be part of that is so special um and to have it played out the way it is now it's just it's not the same as it used to be even it's though disappointing. yes it, it was long weeks yeah but like it was so much, you know, so much bigger, and I, I don't know. I, I just feel like all of a sudden you make it like a 
a, a tournament at the end of the year is just no nah, it, it doesn't work like it, it it used to be a huge huge deal don't get me wrong it's still a big deal but it's not nearly what it used to be i think that uh they they should definitely try to trend back towards what it was and they maybe need to find some middle yeah. ground of, of some kind but every single person that has had the opportunity to play in it or knows it, you know, Leighton Hewitt's been super outspoken about it. Like, it is not what it was. And because it doesn't carry that weight, yeah. I feel like you're just going to see more and more people opting to just not participate because it's not as big yeah. of a deal as it was. And that's sad because yeah. it was really cool. It really was cool. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah that's some cooler. of the best weeks, some of the best weeks that I, that I had on tour were, were playing Davis Cup and being part of the Canadian Davis Cup team. That, that, I mean, that was like the most incredible experience um, and, and playing in front of your, your home country like that. Like, don't get me wrong, college tennis is incredible, but multiply that by 10 and that's what it feels like playing for your country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's like a, you've, it's like you've got an entire world on your back. It's uh, I, I can't yeah. imagine. Just the, the, the that is an adrenaline shot. So, <laughs> that is pure adrenaline. I'm sure that's amazing. No doubt. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. So, I think I just heard maybe one of yours, but do you have any other tennis hot takes? Obviously, that would have been a really good one. So, you might have jumped the gun uh, on that Davis <laughs> Cup needs to go back. But do you have anything else that maybe uh, – I'll give you an example. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to someone about how they feel like, you know, pro events should have a backdrop. Like how cool would it be if you know the backdrop of a of a slam? They played fast four all the way out to third place, and uh, and then there was some extra prize money. You know, people are getting the opportunity to see their favorite players, even if they've lost. A little opportunity to make some extra money, and then it's uh, it, and then in the backdrop, let the let the fans they can uh, they can talk during the points, they can cheer during the points, like just to try these new things. Uh, it was an example that uh, we got from one person in particular. Do you have anything that you're like, wow, tennis would really be cool if if we changed this or did that? I okay, so there's there's two things um, that I, I look. I, everyone has their their opinions, and and they can. And say how they feel, right? I think what makes tennis, you know, so special and so different than a lot of other sports is that it's only you out there um, and you mm -hmm. have no one else, you know, to, to really go to or to, you know, really talk to. That's part of the game is you figuring out while you're out there. So to me, I think the coaching and, you know, the coaching from the sidelines, yes, it's cool and it's cool from um, – a fan perspective, but as, as someone that's, uh, I would say, a, a, a purist, I don't like it. I would get rid of the, the, the coaching, even though they say everyone does it anyway, and it's true with the signals and all that, it's impossible to follow it. Uh, I think, you know, the thing that I would change is let fans cheer, let them clap, let them talk. Like, you know, I can't, the thing that bothers me is like, when I see guys playing and like one person's moving right behind them when they serve and they don't serve, like, come on. Like, have you ever been to a, an NBA basketball game or an NHL hockey game where like people are yelling and screaming in the middle? I'm not saying it needs to get to that level, but I think to me, like, you know, to stop because someone's standing behind someone receiving, like, come on. <laughs> I don't know. That would always bother me. Like if, if someone would not serve because someone behind me was standing up, you know? And I was like, come on, like, you, I know you're focused enough to where that shouldn't bother you. Oh, for sure. And I think from the coaching yeah. standpoint, like I, I am in agreement with both of your hot takes, but I think I, see, bo I see both sides. I see both sides. I get it. I see. I under, get it. As a but coach, if you get to a, a semifinal, coach, yeah. I'm a coach. Yeah. And so like, if I was an opportunity, I'd want to coach. I would want to be able to talk to them between points. I want to do all those things. I agree. I agree. But from a tennis I purist agree. standpoint, that's one thing where I'm like, okay, so if at the French open this year, we get, uh, we get Alcaraz versus Djokovic, and you got Juan Carlos Ferrero in your corner, and you've got a you've got a twenty year old that you're not allowing to actually be a twenty year old. I I know that you at your age when you first went pro, I'm sure you would have loved to have been able to have a coach coach you, you know, constantly. How many more oh, wins a year would that have been? 100%. How much more prize money would that have been? But now we're talking about yeah, in history. How many yeah. games in that match more does Alcaraz win 
because he's got Juan Carlos Ferrero talking to him after every point. It yeah, changes I mean, look, everything. I, I, again, I'm totally with you on that because as as from a coaching perspective, you know, if I was allowed to talk to, you know, Madison or Jessica after every single point, like there's so many things I would have said that I'm not saying it would have changed the course of the match, but I think I could have given some some insight and some things that I saw because when you're a coach and you're seeing things from the outside, you see things that you didn't see when you're playing. Um, you know, there's so many things now when I when I do color commentary for TV or when I do panel work for TV as well, like, and I watch matches and I'm calling them, there's so many things that, that I see that I would never have seen when I played because I'm looking at it from a different perspective and a different angle. So there's, there's so many things that, you know, it can really be uh, a huge help to your player that you could talk, but, and I, and I love that part as a coach, but as a player, like you also want it to stay, you know, and what makes tennis so special. So that, that I see both sides of that argument for sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So kind of shifting gears here, I want to give you the opportunity just to reflect because I personally am a big, uh, you know, I'm a big on telling people to reflect and, and what important practice that is in our lives. So this is kind of your reflection opportunity. What is your happiest tennis moment? Oh, 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 oh man. Um, I mean, that, that's, I, I, I don't know. I don't have one like that. I think winning, obviously my first professional title was, was pretty special. Um, I think, um, playing on center court Wimbledon was, was definitely that, that, that stands out to me as well, because just growing up as a kid and watching breakfast at Wimbledon to step foot and walk, you know, through those doors and, and on the center court, that was definitely a special moment for me. Um, and also, um, I would say winning when I won junior Wimbledon and, and my whole family was there, that was pretty special. Um, you know, both my parents and my brother were there to see it and to come back in the pros and to see my name up, um, on the board there, that's there forever engraved on the, on the board that that was also, I don't know. Then, I mean, there's a lot of moments and, you know, in my coaching, when, when, um, I was with Jessica Pagula, when she cracked top hundred for the first time, that was pretty special. Um, you know, cause when we started, she was like 600 and had never been top hundred before. And now she's three in the world, so it's pretty crazy. She's incredible. I, I like her game a lot. Yeah. I really yeah, do. Yeah. I, I think she's an opportunity away. It's it's she's she's I've been talking for, you know, with a lot of people about how, you know, on the men's side, you, you we're essentially flooding draws. We're gonna be playing slams where it's like, hey, we've got eighteen guys in the main draw and we're gonna eventually saturate the draw enough where you're gonna see more often like Tiafo makes a semifinal and then you're, you know, things going right, a point here, a point there away from winning a slam. But on the women's side, you know, we've had, you know, we've had multiple, you know, single slam champions and all of this. And with the competitor that she is, with the uh athlete that she is. Yeah, everyone's talking about this big three right now. They're talking about uh, Rabakina, Sabalinka, and uh, Sviantek. And, you know, I personally a little sad that Barty's not playing anymore because I really enjoyed watching her play. But that's the uh, yeah. point. Yeah. I loved her game. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Jess is right there to where you get into a semifinal and someone's not 100%. She's going to she's gonna get that opportunity. I feel like, you know, if you keep putting yourself constantly in the quarters, constantly in the semis, she's going to get one. She's too good of an yeah, athlete yeah. to, and she seems very smart and has the ability to obviously, uh, you know, do whatever it takes in a match to execute any type of strategy she needs to. That on a given day, she, she could definitely figure somebody out. I think she's she's it's something that's going to eventually happen for her. So you know, you getting to be a part of that early part of you know that development, that breaking into the top one hundred. Obviously, you're going to always feel like you're a big part of that success, which is just you know, super cool. We've been very blessed in the United States to, you know, pretty consistently have some, some really, other than obviously the Williams sisters, but some very strong uh, female tennis players over the past, you know, however many years. So that's, you know, super cool. That's my rant. Sorry. I wasn't trying to rant. I, another one. Of no, my I love that. Takes, love that. One of my hot takes uh, that I think that you might appreciate. You're someone that uh, you won 
a junior double slam. I'm a big believer with as popular as Little League World Series is that this junior slams need to be televised. That is how we popular popularize tennis. With the way things are changing, with NIL, with the way that people are going to, I think very soon, there you're going to be allowed to have take prize money in junior tournaments. I think in the next 10 years, we'll probably see it. That's my personal opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. I think that's the way we're trending. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that would have changed your career in any way? If, if you know, when you well, went to I, I don't slam, know. I, it would have been on TV? I mean, I, they, they do show uh, um, a good amount of junior slams now on, you know, DirecTV and ESPN3. So you, you do see it. It's not obviously, you know, on national television, but yeah. you can watch matches. So that's definitely an improvement. Um, and even, you know, the challenger circuit, um, in the United States is is live stream now a lot more than when I was playing, right? So I think you have a lot more access to watching, you know, even the 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 challenger circuit and ATP matches on on all the different live streams now because of you know the advancement in technology. So we we as as tennis players need to be thankful for that because it's only growing the sport. Oh, a hundred percent. I think the access is I love challenger TV. Uh, I think it's awesome. Yeah. I think it's it's great that you can just go through shout that. out shout out to that. Mike Cation Mike Cation Mike Cation shout out to him he, he's he's uh, he's a road warrior calling every single one of those challengers in the United States he's awesome I, I'm a big fan of him yeah. I think that he's doing you know incredible things and then obviously you know we, hopefully as this continues to grow um, I don't think tennis is stagnating I think uh, as the world changes I think individual sports are going to become more and more popular. And, uh, and I think he's done a great job of obviously being an advocate for challengers. So yeah, Mike Cation definitely needs a shout out. That's for sure. Um, yep. Oh gosh. Okay. So we've heard he should be that. next. He should be next on your show. I, you know what? That's, that's super funny. I would love that. I would love that. Uh, that would be great. So I would need to find a mutual connection to get that, to get that set up. I got you covered, Mike. If you're not listening, you will be soon, and I will get you on the show, Mike. That's funny because this is my last question because I'm trying to be, uh, you know, uh, respectful of your time, and uh, that is, who do you think needs to come on the Grassroots Tennis Pod? Keep in mind, whoever you say, you have to help us get this person on the pod, and I usually ask people to give me two names is what I say. I usually say one person who's either a community leader and an advocate for the game in some way, maybe a coach or a community leader, and then someone that's an active player of some kind, whether that's, you know, a junior player or that's a college player or anything like that. So you're saying Mike Cation. Is there anyone else you can think of that has a lot of knowledge or that you think should come on here and share? Well, no, I'm sticking with Mike Cation because it came up in conversation. So that was a sign that I am going to reach out to him when we get off and set him up for you. And and, and then we could talk about how he will get guaranteed. You could say, it and, and you're recording this, he's going to say that I chose the wrong orange and blue. Well. Because Mike, Mike Cation is an Illini, and I took a recruiting trip to Illinois, and I love Champaign, Illinois, and I did win a pro title in Champaign, so – and shout out to Champaign, Illinois as well. But Mike was the voice of Illinois tennis and Illinois basketball when I took my recruiting trip there. And I've known him since then. And we've had the pleasure of working together as well at the U.S. Open now. So it's a it's kind of full circle, pretty cool experience. And he's a great guy, a huge, huge, huge advocate for, for, for tennis, but more importantly, good person. If I remember right. Jesse, that 2007 University of Illinois men's tennis team was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they were. Maybe one piece they away were. from something exceptional. <laughs> oh, no. Don't don't give Mike this ammo when he comes on the show. Please do not do that. Oh, man. I was, yeah. Dude, you on that team would have been nasty. That would have been insane. <laughs> oh, man. That was a good team. Holy cow. It was. It was. Oh, it was. Shoot. For those people that don't know, you should go look up the 2007 University of Illinois <laughs> men's tennis team and how they finished that year and who was all on that squad because they were pretty good uh, in 2007. Yeah, they were, deep. they were deep for sure. Yeah, that was a good team. Um, I actually have one yeah. question that I skipped and I'm a little bit out of order, uh, but I just have to ask. So obviously right now uh, you are 35 years old, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're looking at you at 35 and just for comparison for people who don't realize like 
you know, you retired at what age? Sorry, say that again? You retired at what age? I was 26, 27 um, you due to an at, elbow surgery. And I think that this is maybe just an opportunity to like, you know, to ask you specifically, obviously you see guys like, you know, Murray, who with his hip, he's still playing. You see Djokovic, he has some elbow issues. He's still playing all these guys that have pushed each other in a doll. You know, these guys are, older than you and still playing right now. And you've been retired <laughs> since then. <laughs> and then of course, you know, there's people who are always like Roddick retired at 30 years old. You know, how could he do that? Could you just maybe speak to like, obviously this game it's I think it's a beautiful game, but like, obviously just what it, you know, obviously it's a little bit of luck goes into all of it, but what it really takes to kind of take care of your body to play tennis at a high level well, because obviously I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I will say this first, first and foremost, like I'm super thankful and blessed to be able to play professional tennis for as long as I did. Um, I did experience a pretty bad elbow injury and I always told myself that once I got to that level, I never wanted to be that guy that was, that was out there, you know, really just trying to make ends meet because at that point, you know, tennis is so hard and, you know, I didn't want to be out there, you know, being a road warrior and going from tournament to tournament, just trying to, you know, break even. Um, when I got to the level that I got to and I realized that I couldn't play at that level again, that's when I had to be realistic with myself and, and my future. And it was a very tough decision, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the decision that I made. Um, made a lot of transitions in my career and I owe it all to tennis. Um, you know, everything that, that I'm involved with now is because of, of tennis and how much tennis is given back to me, um, you know, from, from coaching, you know, professionals like Jessica Pagula and Madison Keys to coaching top juniors to being a talent scout for, for Nike to doing now TV commentary to now running private clubs um, in South Florida and, being the director of racket sports at these clubs, it's, it's, it's all because of, of tennis. So everything's kind of led to where I am now. And, you know, yes, unfortunately I had to stop playing professional tennis at a young age, but at 35, there's not a lot of people that can say they're involved in a lot of these things um, because of professional tennis to still be involved on the other side of the fence. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you've gotten to do a little bit of all of it. I think that's amazing um yeah do you think uh you think you have any good advice for maybe uh if a parent or a junior player out there listening needs advice like what could a junior player uh these junior players be doing to maybe take better care of their body i'm a huge advocate of cold plunging cold plunging is there like an age that's big, too young big, for that or do you think that it. somebody who just grinded out a that, three-hour that, match that's like uh, 13 could do that I'm not, I'm not a huge, I mean, look, I, I don't want to tell a 13 year old to go and jump in a cold plunge, but um, <laughs> I, I'm pretty, 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 pretty addicted to it. And I, I do feel a huge difference and I wish I would have started doing it earlier because I feel a difference in, in my body. Not that I'm an old man at 35, but definitely beat up compared to when I was 25. And it's something I would have done a lot more often if I knew the benefits of it. Okay, and last, last question. Uh, sure. Can you make a case for all those tennis fans out there? Because tennis, you know, it's a very specific demographic on why uh, those tennis fans should maybe take the time to watch more hockey. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, it's definitely hockey and golf are my, are my go-tos now. I'm obsessed with both. I'm down with a two handicap. My goal is to be scratched by the end of the summer. Um, but I also do play in a men's hockey league, and there's nothing better than watching Stanley Cup playoff hockey and best out of seven series like that. And watching two teams go head to head in the physical battle, and at the end of it, you'll never see a sport that you watch people that hate each other every game, game in and game out, and at the end of a series skate across, shake hands, and have the utmost respect for one another. 
I've told people for a couple of years now that I'm convinced that there are two sports that they hands down are probably like the viewing pleasure, like how much the experience improves if you watch it in person versus on TV. Is yeah, like ho- it, yeah, hockey in person and tennis in person are significantly better than they are on TV. Uh, especially yeah, if you're hockey, trying to watch hockey it. hands down. Hockey is it's a it's so fun. It's so fast paced. Following that puck around, it's all amazing. And then I think some people just don't they don't see how hard how much they don't see how high that ball is clearing the net. They don't see the changes in spins. They can't appreciate the change in direction, especially for like women's tennis. Like I'm telling you when I first got the opportunity. Okay, so I, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you. That's my other hot take is change the camera angle of yes. watching tennis on TV. That's my yes. hot take. Because Put it behind I, them. When I, yeah. So when I, when I've, when I've done um, TV at the U S open, um, I was commentating on a center match, and I'll never forget. I they asked um, the camera guy if he could go back to that angle for the next couple points, so you know viewers could see you know how much center is really clear in the net by. And like everyone started like messaging me on Instagram and Twitter, like, "Oh my gosh, that was amazing!" Like, tell him to keep it there. And I was like, "That I can't do. I don't have that much pull." But he did it for a couple points, and people loved it. So that would be my take is. You know, give people like a good like five to ten minutes of different camera angles so they could see the real perspective of a point. I think it's huge. I think it's huge. The first time that I got a chance to watch uh, to watch a WTA match like in person, like WTA level, I got the opportunity to watch uh, Francesca Schiavone whenever she was like on a tear at Cincinnati, uh, and I was like, how hard she was putting like every ounce of her body. I was sitting behind the baseline every ounce of her energy into every shot, how hard she's changing direction, the, you know, how crisp her slice backhand was, you know, you're watching all that. And then you watch it on TV and they take this camera angle and, you know, it's, she's this tiny woman and the, and you know, the camera's hovering above and it doesn't even look impressive to the average person, you know, in comparison to what it truly is. Um, I think, yeah, changing the camera angle would make it uh, much more enjoyable yeah. for, for the average fan and for people who are diehard fans, I think it would be a win-win for everyone. Yeah, they don't have to do it constantly, but yeah, that should that should be that's the new that's that's going to move to your number one hot take. We've well, said a lot on this, but yeah. I think that's <laughs> dude, that, that would be a, that would that one I think is something just for all of us. We need to make that happen somehow. I don't know who we need to talk to, but uh, Jesse, I just want to say thank you uh, for your time today, and uh, thank you for coming thanks for having me. Uh, I will get you. I will get you, Mike, for your next one. <laughs> Thank you so much. I would love that. I would love to have Mike Cation on here. I know that he has a lot of experiences uh, that he could obviously share and that the tennis world needs to hear. And just to close, if you uh, have any follow-up questions, those of you that are listening to the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, you can reach us at grassrootstennispod at gmail.com or follow us uh, at Grassroots Tennis Pod. Uh, on Instagram or on other social media platforms. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you know someone that should be on this podcast. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And if you have any follow questions, I know how to get to of Jesse and uh, we would be happy to uh, mailbag and I can read you some of those answers. Thank you so much again today, Jesse. We really appreciate uh, you being on today. You have a great night. Uh, you too. Thanks for having me. See you later.